I love actors so much. They're giving me what I need ultimately. But when it's an incompetent, whether it's an actor or a crew member, I have no patience. Not because he's an incompetent, because I can ride over him easily, but it's because he's taking the job of a competent. That's what drives me insane. So I am difficult. Want to hear the other difficult people? Paul Newman, Georgie Scott, Frank Sinatra, Barbara Stanwyck, Anne Margaret, Jimmy Cagney, Bogart, Edward G. Robinson, Spencer Tracy. The Delicate Delinquent is an important Jerry Lewis movie, not just because it's his first solo effort, but because he's working within the framework that has become sort of classic in American 50s cinema. We were blaming rock and roll with these rebellious figures like Elvis Presley and Gene Vincent and Eddie Cochran. And Jerry Lewis thought it would be funny if he was in this rough neighborhood among these other delinquents. And the film starts out just perfectly in that fashion. It starts out like one of those movies, like A Rebel Without a Cause or Knock on Any Door or one of those Nicholas Ray films where the delinquents are coming out and we got this pseudo rock and roll beat with the saxophone solo in the background and they're coming out, you know, with their knives about to have a rumble and all of a sudden, BAM! <laughs> Don McGuire and I wrote the movie together. There was no credit for me as writer because I didn't want to overload, and he did a hell of a job. He was a good writer. The Delicate Delinquent was originally written for Martin and Lewis, prior to the split, obviously, and it was originally called Damon and Pythias. The names are Officer Damon and Sidney Pythias, Damon and Pythias from the Greek myth, and those are supposed to be two absolute inseparable friends. <laughs> Maybe it was metaphoric as far as the Martin and Lewis relationship is concerned because everybody wanted these guys to stay together. Dean was supposed to play the role that Darren McGavin played, but the Martin and Lewis team broke up and it was reactivated as a Lewis solo project. When the split came, Paramount only needed to know they had a film. So I had to give them Delicate Delinquent. I don't know that I would have made it if I had lots of time and freedom at that time. Hiya, Sydney because the pain of seeing Darren McGavin playing Dean's role, I was nervous about how that would affect me in my performance, but it was okay. Maybe the kids were using different kinds of blocks. Oh, I heard it a little. Well, how was the time? The movie wound up being a smash for us. Sing Sing, with its solitary confinement and the electric chair. And it was great for my psyche. It made me feel kind of whole. Though I missed Dean, I grieved and missed. The film helped me get through that because it was working. <laughs> Lewis had filmmaking tendencies and a creative aspects that are beyond just doing the comedy. And in order to present himself as a director, I think he had to find himself first, just breaking from perhaps the most successful comedy team of all time and working his way in as a solo artist. He tries to do what he can with Delicate Delinquent, and when that's a success, then he can experiment a little bit more. I'll go my way by myself. Delicate Delinquent just caught on fire. Who knew he could sing at all? And do you call that singing? 
Rock-a-bye, my baby, in the treetop tall. Rock-a-bye, my baby, when the shadows fall. Rock-a-bye, my baby. After having done The Delicate Delinquent, for his second movie, Lewis wanted to open things up and show everything he had to offer as an entertainer. We see a sort of freeform character that's starting to develop outside of the Martin and Lewis relationship, something on its own. I just loved the movie with the babies. Frank Tashlin said, I got a great idea, and he told me what it was. I said, let's go for it. And it was the Preston Sturgis, Miracle of Morgan's Creek remake. Triplets. That's three of you and only one of me. But I'll try. Frank Tashlin was an incredible director. He had such a good comedic sense about him to begin with that when you added my dad into the mix, it was like giving Tashlin the vehicle by which he could create his imaginary cartoon comedy. I did not know his reputation. To me, he was just some big old guy who was directing the movie. And he allowed me to be so free. This screenplay was all Frank. Frank wrote this, so and I thought he wrote That's to great. a fairly well. Clayton, don't you know anything about little girls? Little girls? Are they all little girls? Yes. They told me while we were discussing the latest in fashion. Well, be careful, don't drop them of her. Jerry paid for my screen test at Paramount. He said, no, this, this girl gets the joke. This, she's a funny kid. Connie was just a breath of fresh air every time she was on that set. Wonderful. I became her adopted daddy. Jerry was working with that fire hose. And I said to Frank, well, I'm chasing him around. I want to do it. And he said, I don't know if you can handle that. And I said, oh, come on. He said, well, we'll turn the pressure down just a little bit. He said, you want to do it? Go do it. Well, I ran around with this big fire hose. <laughs> I took good care of her. I didn't let anybody get close. I treated her like I thought I would do if I ever had a daughter. Which I now know is exactly the way I would do it. <laughs> this is Del Moore, ladies and gentlemen, with the NBC Mobile unit in the exclusive Bel Air section here in Los Angeles. And we're in front of the famous Kingston estate, awaiting the arrival of the Princess Charming of the Grand Duchy of Morovia, who is due to arrive momentarily. <laughs> I went to New York, I said, Mr. Rockwell, I'm not going to use any ad art for the picture. The only thing anyone will ever see relative to this movie will be a Norman Rockwell. You got it. Sit down. That day, I sat down and he sketched me, and I went away. Then I had Anna Maria go to New York, then Edwin go to New York. They all sat for him, and you saw what he did. Oh. What magic. I wanted a family film. I wanted something where we would see Jerry in a less than bombastic role. Heidel Tallman never belonged in Cinderella. like Rockabye Baby, Cinderfella was directed by Frank Tashlin. Tashlin's first film was uh, Martin and Lewis's uh, movie Artists and Models. He cut his teeth on Warner Brothers cartoons, and Jerry Lewis realized that he and Dean were sort of live-action cartoon characters themselves. He had such a point of view. His point of view was cartoon. He thought cartoon. Tashlin also liked this offbeat universe. Jerry Lewis took that and pushed it a little bit further when he began directing his own films. It's all almost surreal to see these actors playing these fairy tale roles and playing them with utter seriousness. The fairy godfather is Ed Wynn. I am your godfather. You're and welcome. having these tough guys like Henry Silva as his stepbrothers. Lewis plays off of all of these characters as the Cinderella character, Cinderfella. Frank, I think, wrote an exquisite script for a comic that had to kind of hold back pretty much. I write too broad, and Frank would write it gracefully and gave it that quality that I wanted. 
because you have to be sure that you give an audience a change or a stretch. It was a tremendous success at Christmas time. That's a time when families are getting together. One of the things they do is they go out to see a show and they don't want to see something heavy like on the waterfront. Sometimes they just want to bring the family out and see something light and funny and colorful and Cinderella fit that bill very, very well. The Cinderella story is something that every child knows from generation to generation. And when you take a Cinderella with Jerry Lewis and Anna Maria Albergetti is the beautiful princess, it's funny. It's all almost surreal. You're nobody at all. Jerry sent a photographer up to photograph me, looking very much like Audrey Hepburn, you know, the hair pulled back so that he could convince Paramount that I was right for the part. She was so stunning. She was perfect for what we were doing. Would you be interested in a shoe like this? Please try it on. I'm sure it would fit you perfectly. No, I think that would be just a little too big for me. That movie was Jerry Lewis from A to Z. For example, the uh, musical numbers in the movie with Count Basie, which was such an incredible sound. He knew every single note every single inflection, and he studied it. Jerry Lewis met Count Basie back when he was a kid because his parents were in show business. He and Basie developed something of a friendship over the years. So when he needed to do something with music, uh, he hired Count Basie's orchestra. And in the context of Cinderella, it works perfectly because this lavish production, all it needs now is a big band. <laughs> the movies when I was a kid. It's the bigness, the size, humongous elements, and in it, gorgeous, beautiful, lavishness, glamour, color. I just couldn't believe the color. I mean, I never used color like that. And I remember Jerry Lewis saying, Bummy, I want lots of color in this picture because as I think, I think film fades as they make print after print after print and through the years, you know. So let's put plenty of color in it. Well, we sure put plenty of color in it. A big set on stage 15. That was a lot of work. That was a big set. I had to work with Jerry and the uh, dance director so that he could do all his dancing on the stair. And as I remember, it was a fairly wide tread and a very short riser, so it made the stairs very long. The entrance, that very amusing entrance into the ball, is one of the best scenes in Cinderella. Edith had made gorgeous, beautiful, so stunning. I remember being so excited when I went for the fittings because I had been such an admirer of hers. I had a red dress with sable trimming and sable cuffs. Oh, God. Edith Head was such a brilliant costume designer. She knew what my dad wanted. She knew what the art directors wanted. The type of quote-unquote Frank Tashlin cartoon colors, and she just turned it into a totally classy piece. It doesn't seem possible, but that is Corkhead. There is nothing like a dame. <laughs> Judith, Judith, you. Hello. She came into my office and sat down the way royalty sits. Mr. Lewis, do you have any idea why you want me for this role? I said, yeah, because you're, you're Judith Anderson and there's only two or three others that would fit the role, and I can't get none of them, so I figured maybe you would do it. It always warms a mother's heart when her sons are proud of her. She said, but, you know, it's very possible that I am much too expensive. 
it'll cost a fortune. And you always screaming at me about my spending. It will be expensive. And as for my screaming, I never raise my voice. Except for that lunatic we have to put up with. I said, Miss Anderson, apparently you haven't heard. I am very extravagant. And I always go overboard with actors because I've learned years ago, an actor never screws somebody that gave them a present. The next morning, the agent, who happened to have been Herman Citron of MCA, he said, Jer, you're talking about 40,000 a week. I said, really? Well, I'm prepared to pay her 60,000 a week. That was the figure to show you how what goes around comes around. New York calls me after Cinderella has been released. I said, Jerry, you know what we figured Cinderella to do, don't you? Domestic US? I said, no. They said, we figured on three million, three million four, but the figure is four million seven because of Judith Anderson. I said, what are you talking about? He said, Jerry, didn't you hear? She's been touring the country doing Medea. And in every city she's been on television, in every radio station, and every newspaper man's lap, screaming about your movie and you. Paramount wanted to release Cinderfellow in the summer because they needed a Jerry Lewis movie. Jerry Lewis said, no, you can't release this during the summer. It's gotta be a Christmas release. That's how I have it all planned. The record album, everything, all the promo. They said, well, we need a Jerry Lewis movie for the summer. I'll make you one. And so he hastily threw together The Bellboy, which turned out to be one of his all-time best films. Mr. and Mrs. America and all the ships at sea, let's go to the movies. What with the world and its tensions today, the uncertainties and the ever-constant fears, take my advice and go see a movie. Not just any movie. Go see and laugh loud at The Bellboy. The day I shot the first footage of the bellboy, I called my dad and I said, Dad, I'm in a state of shock of excitement because I didn't know I knew all of that stuff. I didn't know I knew it. Oh. Frank Tashlin talked me into doing the bellboy. I tried to get Billy Wilder to direct it. Our companies couldn't make a deal. So I told Frank about it, and he said, you're gonna run into the same trouble with any good director. They're gonna want their do deal. They're gonna to. be taking all your money. Why don't you do it yourself? When it came to my doing it, I was such an observer and so keen on learning everything that everybody was doing, and I had to know their job. Each day I was better. Each day the material got funnier. Not only is it Jerry Lewis's first film as a director, it was made under circumstances where he had a lot of limitations. He had a lot of things to consider. I'm in a 10-day window of writing a 163-page screenplay. When I'm up in around 90, I better get a director. I've already alerted Hollywood to send me 135 people. I'm already giving them the start date, and I'm in the middle of writing it. Can you imagine what that was like? And I did two shows every night. He was performing at night, shooting and writing the script as he went along. It was really an arduous process for any man, but Lewis had the energy to pull it off. I was going to make that movie no matter what, and I was at a point, very honestly, whatever came out on the screen, I did the best I could. I wasn't even anticipating anything of any real consequence. Because you can't write that fast, put it together and go shoot it. But the movie, as I see it as a filmmaker, is damn genius. To have been able to get that work in that continuity and to hear an audience go the way they went. Places, everybody! Places! We got a rush call to go immediately to Florida. Jerry was appearing on the stage at the Fun and Bloom. And I remember that night going to see his show, and Jerry had us stand and introduced us to the crowd and said we were there to help him with his picture that he was going to film there. 
And the hotel was filled with all these guests and uh, paying lots of money to stay there. And it just seems like the first day we had the run of the place. But there was a lot of complaints from the guests. People just wouldn't put up with the cables and the stopping of the elevators and everything, darn takes. So it made it very interesting for me. Mr. Selby, I can't tell you how upset I am about this. You're upset. I've got to go back to New York. I have to do a TV show. Now, 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 relax, Mr. Selby, relax. Relax my eye. I'm going to find out who did this terrible thing to me. He has ruined my entire career. Many a night I was on the phone making calls where where I could get this or that, or especially the uh, where they had all those chairs. This is my favorite comedy scene from any movie that I've ever seen. i never seen you laugh so hard. I've got Stanley on theater seating duty. Alone? How long has he been in there? <laughs> I just sent him in. He'll be in here for two, three days at least. It's a wonderful thing. It's all pantomime. Chaplin pantomime, really. The type of comedians who did this sort of comedy did them in silent cinema. But Lewis uses sound in order to enhance the gags. He walks over, takes one chair, sets it down very slowly, moves it into place, drops back about five feet, takes a look at it. After about 10 minutes, he's got to be in trouble. Coffee shop. Have you seen Stanley? Which Stanley? The only Stanley in the world. When I would write a screenplay, I'd send it to Stan, and he would give me notes about what he thought of my work. I had offered him a lot of money to be my editor for my company, which I felt would be a great prestige for my company to have Stan Laurel in it. It didn't happen because he was very proud. I couldn't convince him I needed his help. He said, but lad, you've got it. Stan Laurel was obviously his idol. This is what he wanted to pay back with the bellboy. I think he wanted to show some things that were just simple and fun and creative and finding humor in places that you wouldn't expect to find humor. Laurel spent a few days looking over the script of The Bellboy and wrote all these passages in the margins as to how Jerry Lewis should edit the film for maximum impact. Paramount found out exactly what I was shooting and they said they didn't want to do a silent movie. I said, it's not a silent movie. It's a very noisy movie. It's just that the hero doesn't talk. But remember, there was a cacophony of sounds in that movie. <laughs> Here is our star, the man who will deliver us from TV. Lewis, as director, realized he had to see how a scene played on screen. And because he was also acting, that's something that just couldn't be done. He couldn't just sit behind a camera. So he invented something called the video assist, which simultaneously videotaped the action as it was being filmed. He had a video assist right there so he could watch himself work afterwards. And now it seems like the whole industry can't do without that. Every director in the world uses it now. Directors don't even stand by their cameras anymore. He could immediately go back, see how the scene played, and if it worked, if it needed to be framed differently or it needed to be edited a certain way, he could figure that out on the spot. I'm very proud of the accomplishment because it served not only the director, but the actor the technician, wardrobe, makeup, everybody had a chance at that instrument. So it became a vital instrument for a lot of people. Without Paramount's cooperation, I could never have done it. I didn't have eight or 900,000 that the, that the prototype cost, which I thank them for to this day. They went in with me because it was going to be for a film, ultimately, that I would make with them, which was The Bellboy. Extra, read all about it. Extra, read all about it. The death of Wally Bradford, famous comedian killed in an Alaskan plane crash, 
has left Hollywood in a state of shock. A famous star dies and all the people surrounding him that do things for him, his yes men, feel that they're going to be out of a job because this star commodity has died. And so they get this inept bellboy named Stanley, an homage to the movie The Bellboy, and that of course is Jerry Lewis. He has no talent, no understanding of show business. Okay boys, here's the temple. One, two. <laughs> These people believe that by buying the right clothes, giving them the right haircut, putting a song in front of them, they can make them into this next big thing. In 1964, there were a lot of teen record stars that uh, promotion companies uh, just put together. A good example, the Monkees record company put together some great guys who looked well together, who had never had a band. Stanley Bell! <laughs> Welcome to Teenage Dance Time, Stanley. I always will. Uh, yes. Uh... What it looks at is the area of show business that we know is there, but don't really discuss too much. stars who don't have any substance, don't have any real talent, but they're propelled into stardom just by little appearance things. That's why we have a lot of stars without the talent that should be involved. I think the Patsy went right along with that. They over-exaggerated by making him an utter klutz and still being able to go from nothing uh, up to the top. Lewis admitted that a patsy is essentially George Bernard Shaw's Pygmalion, and he didn't realize that until he was in the cutting room editing it. He mentioned it to his co-writer Bill Richmond, and Bill said, well, at least we stole from the best. Jerry is a master at pantomime, period. To a lot of people, it looks easy. It is really difficult to get it perfect. It's much, much more complicated much more difficult to shoot an idea and a fun thing for laughter silently because you have to explain the joke visually. I think the great comic masters who started in silent cinema are a basis for the Patsy. Lewis, the director, realizing that that visual would be funny. There's a certain sleight of hand there that's very poetic. I think if I had to choose a favorite Jerry Lewis movie that would be The Patsy. He was way ahead of his time, and whether people want to admit it or not, many people in the industry do not give him the credit that he really deserves. They didn't see great actor, they didn't see great director. Those things were absolutely true, but American audiences were loving him and enjoying his work. I was always playing to the masses, from 8 to 80, always. You're on such an energetic, spirited ride, you really don't know. I'm at the studio 18 to 20 hours a day, in love with that process. When I had to cut negative, I thought my heart would stop. When you cut negative, it's goodbye. I used to touch the emulsion to my lip because it would stick. The emulsion would just stick just enough that it was wonderful. Well, every time I'd say goodbye, I had the baby blues like I did with my babies when I sent them on their way at the age of 17, 18, and 20. Those baby blues are waving them in the distance in their car driving away is the same thing as releasing a film. Pretty much. If you care enough about film, it is. How can you not? 